We have started a new message series organized around Randy Frazee's book, Believe. And really, this whole thing came about because our church's elders have decided that our ministry needs to place more emphasis on how we can become more like Jesus in our everyday lives. And in fact, our, our ministry theme for this year is Becoming Like Jesus. And this Believe message series consists of 30 messages divided into 30 sec uh, three sections that answer basically three questions. First section, what do I believe? Number two, what should I do if I want to live what I say I believe? And number three, who am I becoming as a result of what I believe and my actions? And so for this first 10 weeks, uh, this first section of the message series, we are answering the question, what do I believe? And we're looking at some essential beliefs that come straight out of the Bible, straight out of the scriptures, and kind of serve as foundation stones upon which we can build our lives. And it'll help us to have a perspective of life and our world from God's viewpoint. And that makes a difference in how you think and how you live and how you interact. Because your beliefs in these areas that we're going to talk about, they need to be clear because they will make a difference in what you center your life around and what your priorities will be. It will make a difference not only in how you live your life when everything is going just hunky-dory, but it will also affect how you live your life when things aren't going so well. And today we're going to talk about who God is in relation to our lives. He is a God who cares. Say that with me. He is a God who cares. I want you to believe that with all your heart and to not ever forget that, especially when we're going through rough times. Because sometimes people think of God as, as just kind of uncaring and aloof, like he's up there somewhere, but he's never down here. We, they see him as a great God in the sky, but, but not as one who is very much involved with their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. But the Bible is clear that God is not just up there somewhere looking down on us, uninvolved and unconcerned about what you're going through. He cares very much. And there are many places in the scripture where we could turn to to see illustrations of this, of how God is a caring God. But we're going to look primarily at one episode today that shows us God is a God who cares. He is involved in our lives today, even when sometimes it seems like he's not. So I want you to open up in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. Luke is the third gospel in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so that's where it fits in. Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. In this story, out of the gospels, we see very clearly that God cares about you. Joy Crichton, in an article for Lookout Magazine, shared about the time when she lived in Johannesburg, South Africa. And she said, when you live in the murder capital of the world, fear takes on a whole new meaning. Twelve years ago, her family of seven, they all relocated to Johannesburg while on a church planting mission. And she says, it was a far cry from my small little town in Ohio where I grew up. She says, whereas my mother taught me how to survive a tornado, I taught my five little ones, the oldest one who was eight at the time, what to do in a carjacking. How would you like to have to talk to your kids about that? That is definitely a different world. And one night while her children were attending youth meetings, an armed suspect ducked into their building while fleeing from the police. And she told of how that night, for the very first time, she asked the Lord to send them home. Her fears and her frustrations caused her to question God's direction for their lives. And she wondered why God would allow them to be in such danger. Because after all, they were doing the Lord's work, right? Maybe you've thought the same thing before. I'm trying to honor God with my life. Why is it so hard right now? Well, something very similar happened to the disciples, too. And the thing is, they were with Jesus when things were falling apart, and they wondered if he really cared about them. 
They had followed Christ's call. They had said goodbye to their families. They had quit their jobs. They left their possessions to follow Jesus. In the first month, they watched Jesus heal the centurion's son with just a word. They watched him cure leprosy with just a touch. They saw him raise the widow of Nain's son from the dead. And then after a full day of teaching and feeling the press of the crowds, Jesus led them into a boat where, once they were under way, he just gave into exhaustion. He fell asleep in the boat, and while he slept, a, a storm rose so fiercely that it caused terror even in the hearts of these very seasoned sailors. Fear and frustration sometimes causes us to question God's direction in our lives, doesn't it? What we must learn is to put our hand in the hand of the one who calmed the sea and who can calm the storms that rage in our lives today. Now, at first, this is a hard thing to do, putting your hand in the hand of the God who loves and in the, in the hand of the, of the God who is sovereign, but we must do that. We must just do that. And the question is, how? What does that even mean? Put your hand in the hand of the one who is sovereign and in control. How do you put your hand in the hand of God when you're going through tough, terrible times and you just feel like giving up? How, how can you and I find strength in these storms that blow into our life? I, I want you to know today that God cares about you. And to not just know that in your mind, but to know that with your life. And I want to share with you four things you can do to put your hand in God's hand as you walk through tough times. First, number one, anticipate storms ahead of time. Anticipate storms ahead of time. Why? Because then you can prepare for them. You can be ready, right? Have you ever seen the Poseidon Adventure movies? Do you remember those movies? Or, or the other one that's more recent, The Perfect Storm? How many of you saw The Perfect Storm? That was depressing, that was depressing wasn't it? Well, in these movies, these ships, they encounter these huge waves, right? And they come into them and they flip them over and these ships sink. And it's like, there is no way they're getting through this. Well, in Luke chapter 8, verses 22 and 23, it tells us, <laughs> One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat, and they set out, and they sailed. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. Now picture this scene of their boat reeling around in these mountains of water, Water would be washing into their boat and over the rails and the sailors would be going up one mountainous wall of water and cresting over the top and sliding down the other like a giant roller coaster. They'd be bailing water. They would be panicked as their minds just became consumed with how are we going to survive this thing? It would be hard to think straight. And now... In that moment of trial, even though they had sat at Jesus' feet learning about God's sovereignty, and learning about his strength, and witnessing his healing powers, now all of that truth, and for them in that moment of fear and devastation and frustration, it just kind of left them. They weren't thinking about anything that they had seen with Jesus. In the storm, there wasn't time for Peter to, to just kind of call a meeting with them and review everything that they've been through and all that they learned from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. <coughs> yes, that's what they should have been doing as they watched the storm approach on the horizon, right? Storms come. Storms happen. Why are we so often taken by surprise when they then come into our life? And when storms begin to gather on the horizon of our life, we ought to anticipate that there are going to be times when that happens. Don't be surprised by that. Don't shake your fist in God's face and say, why God, you know, why is this happening? Why can't you just take all this away from me and make things better again? And rather than be struck by fear and frustration and anger, yours and my anticipation of the storms ought to help us prepare for how to confront them with faith and boldness. Storms come, they just do. 
It's not necessarily God trying to make your life miserable. In fact, 99% of the time storms come because we live in a world that's still impacted by sin and all its consequences. Our world is still fallen. It's not fully restored yet. It won't be until Jesus returns and judgment takes place. Did you think that our world was fully restored right now? Until that happens, there will be troubles and trials. There will be pain and death. Knowing this then ought to energize you to build up your faith in tough times not be debilitated by them, not be surprised, be built up. Here's a second way that we can know that God cares about us and he hasn't just deserted us and we can put our hand in his hand. Number two, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. You see, the time to suit up for the storm isn't when the waves are you know, coming over the deck and the ship is sinking and the wind is ripping the sails apart. That's not the time to prepare. At that point, you're just doing all you can to hold on, right? You're just doing all you can to keep that boat afloat. Jesus, he slept in the stern of the boat during the storm and the disciples were afraid they were going to drown. That's crazy. How can that happen like that? But here's what was happening in the storms. The, the disciples had forgotten what they'd seen Jesus do. They'd forgotten what he had promised them and who they knew him to be. And I wonder, what does our panic and frustration during times of trial say about how well we really know our God? When we're panicked and we're frustrated and we're just at wit's end, what does that say about how well you know God? If the 12 had confronted the storm, remembering all that they had seen Jesus do and what he had promised them and who they knew him to be, the storm would have been just as real and they still would have had to wrestle with the sails. But the difference would be that because they were looking at Jesus, they know that even though the struggle was hard, the boat isn't going to sink. They would survive. They would get through it. Their hope would be placed in God's strength. So you can go through life's storms without looking to Jesus. You can choose to do that. Go through the storms without looking at Jesus. And guess what? The storms are still going to be there. Do you think just because you don't look at Jesus, the storms are going away? They're still going to be there. But guess what won't be? Your hope, your perspective of life from God's viewpoint, it will be gone. So having a godly hope and having a godly perspective about life, especially during the storms, it makes all the difference in the world as to how you come through them. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 24, it says, The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to what? Drown. We're going to drown here. He got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters, and the storm subsided and everything became calm. Amazingly enough, in the midst of the frenzy, Jesus slept. How could he just lie there, seemingly unconcerned about their precarious plight? Why does God seem inactive in our fiercest storms? The songwriter Gordon Lightfoot, if you like, Gordon, you like his songs, Gordon Lightfoot, you remember his song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald? I was in high school. I remember that song first came out. I was fit in a field out in north of Corona <laughs> on the tractor, and I was singing that song. But there's this verse in there, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, that goes, does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes into hours? Have you ever experienced that? You're going through hardship and the waves, it's like not just minutes, it's hours. And it sometimes seems like God doesn't care what we're going through when those stormy waves are rolling into our lives. But those are the times when we have to be even more intentional about looking at Jesus. After the disciples did everything they could do to save themselves, they turned to Jesus in the storm. They saw him lying there and they called out, Lord, we're dying here. Don't you care? And when the disciples looked at Jesus, though, here's the thing. They finally got something right. 
They let their fear and their frustration drive them to Jesus. And after they had done all they could do, and and we have to do all we can do, right? Then they entrusted their lives to him. They entrusted the rest to him. Isn't that really the best way to address trouble? What good does it do you to do everything you can do to make things better And then when it's still not working out, you get mad and you get hopeless and you accuse God of leaving you. Listen, Jesus was still in the boat. He never got out. He was still there the whole time. And he's with you too. You have to look at him. Stop looking past him. Stop looking at him as the last resort. Stop thinking it doesn't matter if you look at him or not. That you can just take him or leave him. It matters. That day on the lake, the disciples let their fear and frustration take them to Jesus. And when we do that, as we go through storms, that's when calm and peace enters our mind and into our experience. It's it's that peace that surpasses all understanding that Paul talks about. We go through storms and we're all preoccupied with trying to do things our way, you know, that'll take us out of the churning circumstances as quickly, as painlessly as possible. And we go to the Lord and we present to him our our best plan for his blessing and we expect him to just kind of cater to our needs, even if our plan isn't his plan for addressing what we're going through. But we want shortcuts, right? We want it easy. And... It doesn't always work out that way. I don't always know why things are sometimes so hard. I don't always understand why I have to have pain in my life. But I know that if I will look at Jesus, it helps me to trust him to bring me through the storm as I do what I have to do, but then I trust him to fill in the gaps where I can't do anything about it. So the disciples had come to the end of their rope. They turned their eyes to Jesus. And after Jesus calmed the storm, he asks them this question, why were you so afraid? Where's your faith? Where's your faith? And that leads to the third thing we need to do. If we want to know God is the one who cares about you, you can put your hand in his hand by answering this question. Where is your faith? I wish that you guys wouldn't mind if we took an extra half hour for me to just go up to each of you right now and ask you, where's your faith today? See it in Luke 8, 25? Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. At the beginning of the storm, their faith was in their skill as sailors. Everything was going well. They got in their ship. They started tooling across the Sea of Galilee with hardly a second thought. They'd done it a million times before, right? They thought they were in control of their situation, but then all of a sudden the atmosphere quickly deteriorated and it became obvious that they had misplaced their faith. They put all their faith in themselves when their faith should have been put in the man who in the midst of the storm, even though his robes were soaked with seawater, enjoyed a sleep induced by a heart and a trust of his fate in his heavenly Father. Once awake, Jesus asked about their faith. He didn't ask them how big their faith was. He didn't ask them, you know, how much faith they had. He asked them where their faith was placed. And it's a question that Jesus asks every single one of us. Where is your faith? Is it entirely in yourself? Is it in your IRA or your bank account or your your retirement? Is, Is your faith in your spouse? Is your faith in the President of the United States? I I loved how John was leading us in Sunday school today and talking about that whole thing, you know. I mean, let me tell you, looking at where the presidential election is taking us, you better not be placing your faith in the President, right? I mean, what about your employment? Do you put your faith in your job? Better not do that. Do you place your faith in your good health? Ugh. I'm just hoping I can get through this sermon without coughing like I did last week. <laughs> I thank Matt for taking care of me. He, he had Richard go out and get me some, some cough drops, and I think it's helping. I think it's making a difference. We'll see here. I still have two pages to go. <laughs> <laughs> 
But it's a question that Jesus asks us. The object of your faith needs to be the one who stills the storms, the one who is sovereign over the universe like we talked about last week. Storm stilling is nothing to him, but you got to realize something. The goal of our faith, it isn't so that God just removes all your trials and your troubles. That's not the goal of your faith. The goal of your faith is knowing him well enough so that you trust him in either the good times or the bad times. See, too many people, they're, they're fair-weather Christians. You know, you've heard of fair-weather friends, right? Fair-weather Christians are people who, they'll trust in God and, and they'll act like a follower of his as long as everything's going good. But oh my, if things go bad, you know, they have some hardship in their life, they doubt in his goodness and they cuss and they throw a hissy fit and they stop going to church because they don't think God cares for them. But he does. He does. You remember Job from the Old Testament? As his treasures and everyone he held dear were sucked into the funnel of that storm, he said, this is Job 19.26, he said, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. When Job said that, he thought he was going to die. And yet his faith wasn't placed in himself. It was placed in the God whom he would see directly in the next life to come. That's where his mind was. That kind of faith comes as I acquaint myself with God's ways and his word and as I pray for him on constant, continual ways and on a basis. I, I don't give up on God when I'm going through tough times. I, I don't leave God when things get difficult. If I do that, God doesn't stop existing. Your problems don't go away. The only thing that stops existing is my faith and my hope. In the midst of the storm, it's hard to be still and to know God. The more panicked and frustrated I feel, the more I flail and cry, the harder it is to hear his voice. But when the storm comes, as I anchor my faith in the truths of God, those truths give me calm in the chaos, and I feel God's presence with me as I'm walking through it. Here's one more thing I can do that helps me to see God as one who cares about us, that helps me put my hand in the hand of God. Number four, remember God with reverence. Verse 25 of Luke 8, it ends with this. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. With Christ's words, quiet, be still, there came an immediate calm. You would have thought that the disciples would be relieved at that point. But instead, they're terrified even more, and they start asking, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him, they say. They were scared. But why? This wasn't the first time in their history that God controlled the sea. They should have remembered that, but they forgot. You remember when the Jews were fleeing Egypt? They had been enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. And then Moses comes along and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh, of course, is resistant to that idea because he's got a bunch of free labor, right, to build all his pyramids and everything. Well, after the ten plagues, Pharaoh stops fighting against God and the Jews leave Egypt. They take off, but then Pharaoh changes his mind and he starts pursuing the Hebrew people because he wants to force them to come back. And then they come up against the Red Sea and they're trapped. But then God does a miracle. You know, you know the miracle he does. You've seen Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the parts that Red Sea... And every Hebrew walks through the Red Sea on dry ground, the Bible tells us. You know, if you were to suck out the water from a lake or whatever, would the ground be dry right there? It would be muddy. You would probably sink up to your hips in the mud. Bible tells us God dried up that ground and they walked across that. And then he commands the sea again and what's it do? It comes back on the Egyptian army, totally crushing them. Well, what do you think? If the disciples had remembered God's faithfulness to them in the past, do you think they'd be afraid now and wondering, you know, why, why is he not being faithful to them? If they had remembered that God had always taken care of them 
and God had always met their needs, do you think that they would now be asking, who is this? And what about you? Has God been faithful to you in your past? Has God been faithful to you in your past? Don't you think he'll be faithful to you now when you're going through hardships? Remembering God's faithfulness to us in our past ought to strengthen our trust in him today. It's when we forget what God has done for us that we become fearful and frustrated. But remember, he was with us then. He'll be with us now. Remember God with reverence and recognize that he is in the boat with you right now. Stop taking him for granted. Stop looking past him. We easily become troubled by our financial situations. We easily become stressed out by personal problems, wondering, you know, what if they have an accident or what if she gets cancer or what if he doesn't do well in school. We worry about the morality of our culture. We worry about who's going to be the next president of the United States. We fret over our children and we worry about our homes. But in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, Jesus tells us, not to worry or stress out over the issues and problems that come as storms in our life. And Julie talked about that in the children's sermon today. I'm not going to read that whole passage, but let me just highlight some of those verses. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Boy, there's some truth in that, isn't there? Well, God cares about us. Even when we can't see him working in our lives, he is working in our lives. And that's why Jesus invites us to bring all our cares, all of our concerns to him. God doesn't want us to go through life worrying about everything that may or may not happen. He wants to be a part of our lives, and he invites you to put your hand into his. He wants us to know that we can trust in him. And it's easier to do that when you anticipate that you're going to have storms. It's easier to trust God as one who cares when you look at Jesus and you place your faith in him. And finally, it is easier to remember that God cares about you and to put your hand in his when you regularly remember him with reverence and all of his faithfulness to you through the years. He has carried you through storms in the past. He will carry you through the storms right now. God loves you. God cares about you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in this one little story in the Bible, we can see how much you care about us through Jesus. And Lord, forgive us for when we forget that you are present with us even when we're going through hardships and difficulties. All we got to do is, is look to the front of the boat and we'll see Jesus there. He's there and he cares. And we pray that out of that kind of care for us, we will reach out to one another and extend the same care to others that you have given to us. And so we love you and we thank you for this message out of Luke and that he, by your inspiration, recorded that for us so that we could be inspired in our lives and strengthened in our faith today. Because sometimes when we're going through the rough times and rough seas, it's, it's not pleasant. But we know that you care. And this is one example of that. May we go forth in our week with your blessing and your success and may we be that light unto the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>